Hello friends, it's Kayla. After three years and nine episodes, it's finally the end of Third Time's the Charm. It's the end of a series, it's the end of an era. In this video, I'm gonna be reading three authors that hopefully I give four and a half or five stars. And then I have read three books from them that I've given four and a half or five stars and I can consider them one of my all-time favorite authors. These are all 2023 releases and they're thriller horror stuff, so this felt like the perfect season to do this in. Uh, we're starting with Rouge by Mona Awad. My history with this author, I cannot find, is it five ways of looking at a fat girl or 10 ways of looking at a fat girl? It was her debut novel, I loved it. It's not for everybody, very unlikable people in it, unlikable things that she had to say. It's not the kind of book you like, but it's a book that I really appreciated and then I put bunny on my list of books I needed to read the next year. I did and it turned out to be one of my favorite books of all time. So that's two five stars from Mona Awad. Uh, last year I also happened to read her newest release All's Well. I read it for my book club. I gave it a three. I appreciate a lot of things about it but didn't love it and so we're still looking for that third five star and maybe it'll be here. Um, I've heard that this is actually quite similar to All's Well so I'm going into it with low expectations. I know it's got dark fairy tale vibes. We've got a girl whose mother recently died and she gets involved in something that her mother was involved in to do with the beauty industry. I was kindly sent this actually by the publisher so I'm very excited to read this. The box that it came in came with this um, little face mask as well so I'm gonna try that out in the video and a lipstick. The next author I don't have the book physically here so I'll show you over here. It's The Reformatory by Tanana Reeve Dew. This comes out on Halloween so I will be reading it on Halloween. And my history with this author is with these two four and a half stars, The Between and The Good House. I like these a lot. I think she does horror really interestingly. We're often in a family, a lot of family dynamics, a lot of internal kind of hauntings. They've been so close to a five star, but I feel like they're just a little too long. So I, I again need to adjust my expectations properly for this because I think it's 600 pages. But it has to do with a young boy in Jim Crow, Florida, um, going, being sent to a reformatory and he has the ability to see ghosts because his mother recently passed and he learns all about what's really going on at this reformatory. I think we're also following his sister's perspective as she's trying to get him out before something horrific happens to him. And lastly, I've got Zero Days by Ruth Ware. Now this is not my third Ruth Ware. As you can see, it's not necessarily the third time I'm reading from an author, but it is my third five-star hopeful, I guess, is how you describe it. So I've read every single Ruth Ware. The first couple that I read in A Dark Dark Wood and The Lion Game were three stars, but I felt like there was something special with Ruth Ware. There was something that was gonna make me love her books at some point. So of course I picked up The Woman in Cabin 10 when it came out and I gave it a two, but I still like had to persevere. I ended up reading The Death of Mrs. Westaway and it was a 4.5 and then The Turn of the Key came out and it was a five. So she is officially in the running to be a favorite, even though her last two books were fours. And I actually read both of these for my book club and they didn't go over super well with everybody, but I thought they were good solid fours. So again, because of that range of ratings, I'm trying to place my expectations in the right place with zero days. This has a husband and wife who engage in I don't know what you would call it, security testing. And on one of their jobs, the husband goes missing or dies. And now she has to figure out what was going on, who he was working with, who had it out for him, is somebody placing her in danger. I haven't seen a lot of people loving this, but I guess I'll see how it goes. So these are the three things I'm gonna be reading this week and I'll check in with you as soon as I start one. Hello, good morning. I need to take my vehicle through a car wash. Um, I thought I would update you this morning because it's, oh my God, I was gonna say bright and early. It's dark and early. It's, what time is it? It starts with a five, it's too early. Um, but I'm starting zero days while Liam is at hockey practice. I read the first chapter in the video where I read the first chapter of everything on my TBR and it was long, I feel like, 22 pages, maybe not. And the way it kicked off is this woman going through the security system is building, and it was a really exciting start because you thought that she was 
like kind of villain in the story if you don't read the synopsis and realize that she tests security systems and like cyber security with her husband for a living it just feels like you're following her doing something shady and it was so fun and then at the end of the chapter you realized that this was her job she's like talking to the security people trying not to get in trouble and she's like no i was hired by the company to come in and test your security and their security is terrible because she gets around so many places in the building while her husband is at home doing the stuff on the computer and then the next chapter she's going to find out that he's missing or dead i don't remember which i do remember it's in the synopsis but i would like to discover that moment myself um but i'm sure it's right here so i will tell you about that and spoil that even though it's in the synopsis in just a second but speaking of spoilers if you do want to know absolutely everything step by step that goes on in this book i'm actually filming a full spoiler review for my channel members this is what they voted on which is exciting because i actually would have I, th I thought i would have preferred one of their other two options um but having already read those books at this point there isn't that much to talk about that i would have wanted to spoil but this i've gotten the feedback that people like weren't planning on picking it up so they just want me to tell them everything that happened so if that's you and that's something you're into it's over here for now i'm going to sit here in the dark by the light of the street lamp and read the next couple chapters and just get a feel for what's going to happen the husband is indeed dead and she is worried because she's the one who found him that she's going to be implicated what i'm really liking at this point is she is being interviewed by the police and when she got home and she found his dead body she naturally had like a traumatic kind of uh response and now she doesn't know how much time has really passed how long it was until she called the police and so they're questioning her timelines and within those scenes naturally mystery books have a lot of internal monologue especially when somebody like doesn't know anything that's happening and they're running through the things in their head there's a lot of just internal thoughts and pages and pages of memories and opinions and perspective and Ruth Ware is using that as also like a way to pass time rather than just pages and pages of monologue. And then we get back into the scene. It's like someone has been talking to her the entire time she's having these thoughts and clearly she's not fully in her body. And so time is effectively passing while she's, while, while we're reading pages and pages of her thoughts. And then she'll snap out of it and be like, oh, someone was trying to talk to me for the last couple minutes. And she'll try to figure out what the detective is saying. I am 170 pages in, so not quite halfway, and I feel like we haven't learned anything. Jack is on the run. Uh, Gabe is still dead. She's learned a couple, like, things about her husband's past, but really not that much. She's more so at this point trying to get to a place where she can look into what's going on with him if he was up to anything there's a couple people that she has trusted um with what she's doing and where she is and so naturally you can have some different theories um about what's going on there's a kind of villain of the story somebody who we're intended not to trust and then there's a character who we are intended to trust and so naturally just because of the way the thrillers are written i think I want to believe the opposite is true as what the main character believes. However, because of her job in like security systems and figuring stuff out, she is an intelligent woman. I don't want to believe her to be somebody who is naive and trusting of people who shouldn't be trusted. So I don't really know what to think at this point. The beginning was a slow setup, but Mm, I was gonna say it's fast moving now. I don't think that's true. I think that the book tricks you into thinking that because Jack is constantly moving herself, but the plot is not moving very quickly. So that's where I'm at now. I just ran out to do some groceries. It is getting so cold and I'm now like 70% of the way through the book. I have a pretty good theory of what I think is happening but honestly we just haven't learned like that much we're following the same kind of plot from the beginning i don't feel like a lot of things have been discovered there's not a lot of key players in the story i think i know who killed the husband and i think i know 
who's responsible for doing the other thing that's going on in the story. And since it's the only other thing going on in the story, I don't wanna spoil it for you. I'm excited to find out if I'm right. I'm not loving the book. It feels a little basic. I want something a little more exciting. With that said, I am enjoying following Jack more at this point in the book because She's not making just stupid decisions. She is giving us evidence of why she's in the career that she's in. And she's doing some intelligent things like getting into various places and hacking into stuff and tricking people into allowing her to do things. Basically, it's interesting enough to keep reading, but I can already tell you this is not gonna be, unless it pulls off like some wild plot twist, that'd be so fun. Even then, I don't know that it would be a five star, so, or a 4.5. Um, I don't see Ruth Ware officially in this video becoming the third time is a charm situation, but we'll see. I'm approaching the end. I just want you to know I'm bored. That's all I have to say. Now I know that reading a book in one day, uh, the concept of that is just ridiculous in itself. So me saying this out loud sounds stupid, um, but this should not have taken me a whole day to read. This is not the kind of book that should have taken 10 sittings like it's a fast-paced thriller it's 350 pages but it took me all day to get through this and I think that gives you an idea of my rating maybe uh it's a it's a 2.5 and I wish that it was lower I wish that I could have hate read this like I wish it did something awful to me but I just wasted my time like this is such a waste of time it's not a good book it's not interesting but it also didn't do anything objectively wrong I just like, this is not Ruth Ware. I don't know. Could you tell me a single attribute besides the careers of these two people? Do we get to know them in any capacity, anything they care about, anything they think about? And yes, it only takes place over a week and she is grappling with the death of her husband and that's the focus of it. But I need some type of character work to really care. Like, we didn't really get flashbacks. We didn't get friendships. I, maybe something that I like about some of her books are the groups of friends that we get. But it was just her and it was her just like constantly swearing. <laughs> it sounds like I'm taking issue with swear words. I'm not. But like her constantly just being like, shit, oh shit. Oh, my wound is gushing, shit, shit, shit. It like almost started to sound funny. And I did listen to the audiobook for a little bit and the narrator, did not sell it well. It made it even, even worse. The, oh fuck, oh fuck, what am I gonna do? I feel bad for the woman, let me be clear. This is a horrific circumstance. Um, but she just did not exude the type of intelligence that I feel like she should have. The villains were not villainous enough. Um, she didn't really solve much by the end. In fact, there was a time jump and then everything's just perfect. I don't know, this one was not for me. I think that thriller authors, there are some that pumping out a book every single year is fine because they do popcorn thrillers and it's just meant to be entertaining. But because I know for a fact Ruth Ware can pull off stunning writing, complex characters, twists and turns, I think putting a book out a year is doing herself a disservice. While I want her career to thrive and I want her to come out with all of these books, I think they need a little more time. Hopefully we're on an upswing from here. Hello again, welcome back to my bathroom mirror. I am gonna try out this face mask today that I got in this super cute package. They came with a bunch of like fake rose petals and a red lipstick and a little mirror for Rouge from the publisher. So this is what I'm reading today. I read the first two chapters just now and I thought, how funny would it be to wear this in my thumbnail? <laughs> so that's what I'm gonna do. And the exciting reason I can take my thumbnail is my pre-order of the reformatory came in early. So that means I'll be able to put this video up in the time frame that I've allotted, which is exciting. The packages came in, I thought it was leaking, but now I can't find anything, any flaws in the packaging. So I think maybe it just got like stuck in the rain somewhere because the box was wet when I opened it. So the book opened with our main character, Mirabella listening to a story as a child about just like the most beautiful woman. And then we're following her as an adult after her mom dies and she goes to her funeral. And ew, <laughs> there's this woman there 
who goes, your mother went the way of the roses and she doesn't know what that means. I don't think my face is gonna fit into this properly because I have big eyes and a squished nose. Oh no, I don't like it. Am I able to cut it? Cause my eyes don't fit properly. Maybe I don't want this as my thumbnail cause it's properly frightening. Yeah, look, there's so much more space for my nose than I actually have. Oh my god. But that's the whole thing about the book, is it's about the beauty industry. We're following this woman obsessed with skincare because that's all her mother cared about was being beautiful. And I think she's gonna figure out there's like this dark underbelly of the beauty industry too. I'm supposed to leave this on for 30 minutes. And our main character just got a message from like this beauty thing, cult perhaps, and there was this series of clips in this video like a jellyfish in the water and a red apple and a woman's face and i feel like this must be a jellyfish so i'm gonna continue reading this uh really dive into the beauty regime and i'll come back to you well my skin feels quite nice i will admit um i've now gotten 10 chapters in and she's just getting introduced to this spa that her mother went to and they're inviting her there for like some free treatment it definitely feels like a fever dream and uh, the main character is talking about how she's just a very like polite girl um so her entire life she's just kind of gone along with anything she agrees she's very agreeable that's why she's successful at her job because she will just tell everybody that they look perfect all the time in whatever dress they want she works in a dress shop her mother owned a dress shop she's going through her mother's stuff she finds these shoes she puts them on and they bring her um to this spa she doesn't quite know what's going on there but they do give her or somebody gives her these um, rose-shaped gummies that are full of collagen and she takes them and that makes it even more sinister that they gifted that to me in the PR box I opened this like a month ago and then forgot about it these are so good I'm enjoying it enough so far I actually got asked to participate in a live show for uh, Elizabeth reading Riley's book club the Midnight Society this is their book club pick of the month so I'm gonna be co-hosting the live show and I think there's gonna be a good amount of things to discuss um, especially if you've read All's Well I wonder if you thought really deeply into it you could make certain connections between all of Mona Awad's books like different characters who could be referenced it as background characters and because there are these characters who are known as performers in like so many of her books I just associate them all as being like perhaps references to other people we already know I could be so off base I wonder if she would talk about that in any interviews I'm gonna eat some more of these though um I'm headed into town I have to pick up Liam and then I have to go get him some new glasses we need to get some uh, winter boots because it is about to snow. And then I have to take him to uh, dry land for hockey. So I'll see you probably late tonight. I did not end up reading any more of Ruse yesterday. The day just got away from me and was busier than anticipated. But today I'm reading on and I'm gonna use the little mirror <laughs> and lipstick that they sent. This is Super Red from Revlon. I own way too many of these but this red is like literally perfect I actually already wore it in a video the day that I got it and everyone was saying well I feel like I got like one or two comments and were like nice lipstick and so I took that as everybody loves my lipstick <laughs> I don't have a red lip liner though so it might get a little bit messy I'm the kind of girl that really needed the makeup community in 2014 to teach me that trick because <laughs> I could get lipstick all over my teeth it's already kind of all over my face anyway I like it and uh before I finish my book I thought I would just show you a package I got and I'm so sad because I've missed the mailman the last couple days he's been knocking on the door so lightly and I just think as normal they're leaving a package and then I go out there and there's no package and today he knocked and I was like I should probably actually answer the door so I did and then he handed me the debit machine I was like you owe 50 dollars in customs <laughs> and it's just been a while since I ordered something big from a small business and I forgot about customs because I'm pretty sure the shipping was like $30 the item itself was 50 and then customs were 50 but I really wanted it because I've wanted one of these for so long I actually want to make one myself but I finally just decided to splurge ah! because this one has two different slots it's to hold your book on your nightstand. Check it out. And there's a little spot that you can put like your glasses, your phone, whatever. You can do it this way and then have a whole nother book down here. And then there's still a spot 
for anything that you want in there. Isn't this so pretty? I'll link down below the shop. I know there's a couple places that make them, but I just feel like this shape is unique. Okay, here's the business card. Ashwood and Hawk. That's who I ordered from. She was very responsive to an email that I sent too, so customer service quality. If you're in the States, the shipping is far more affordable and you won't pay customs. So lucky you. But anyway, I'll check in with you again once I've actually read some of Rouge and have a real reason to film. So of course, as I chose this as a third times the charm contender, I wanted it to be on some level thought it could be. But realistically, this is the exact rating that I thought it would be. and I'm leaving it at a three. And I'm pretty much saying the exact same thing I said about All's Well last year, that I don't know that I can pinpoint anything that this book did wrong or anything that I didn't like. I am going to have a hard time like describing what it was that didn't give four star or five star vibes. I like what Mona Awad is doing. I think she has such an intent with her books. She has a plan, she has a goal, and she accomplishes that. I think maybe it's the pace and the actual story itself and where we're spending time that I just find really drawn out. Even though I understand that it does give the impact that she wants, this is surrealist kind of literature. It's a fever dream. It's something that can be interpreted a lot of different ways as an allegory for grief, as an allegory for uh, people pleasing beyond all of the beauty standard conversations that come along with it. But I feel like the middle just could have been completely cut out and it did reinforce the fact that our main character has completely lost it. Like she's hallucinating things, mannequins are talking to her, she sees a man in her house and thinks it's a mermaid or a merman, sorry. She's hallucinating her dead mother. She's just in a fog the entire time. It's not the culty kind of story, which I don't like anyway, so this is not a critique. Um, but if you go into it expecting a culty kind of story, it's not the one that is somebody clear-headed entering into a situation, getting manipulated into something, investigating and learning, you know, the dark underbelly of the cult. It's not her meeting the key players. It's not looking at her from an outside perspective and watching her get manipulated. You're in her head and she is in a fog the entire time and the writing is foggy the entire time. The language is odd. It's constantly her asking questions, looking around going, where am I? I'm safe, aren't I? You're my mother, aren't you? And I think it lends itself well and Mona Awad's writing lends itself well to a short story format and I wish she would do some of that. There's not enough plot in here to necessitate 400 pages but I do understand that the deeper she is into it and the more confused that she gets you as the reader are also stuck in this dream-like state and the further it goes on the more concerned you feel and that is the goal. The writing's beautiful I just think it's too long. I of course will continue to pick up everything that she writes um, but I'm interested in her going in a different direction. And I can definitely pinpoint all the things that Bunny does for me that her other stuff, or the last two things, haven't. The way you really get to decide for yourself what the book is even saying when the last two have been more clear in their intent, which is probably good for broader audiences. Not that it holds your hand, but it gives you more clarity for what the book is saying and what the characters are really thinking and how everything ends. So there are still things we get to think about and talk about um, in the live show. I'm excited to do that. That's coming up soon. Today, what I'm up to is I'm doing uh, the Halloween movie night with my channel members. We're watching The Final Girls. It's a horror comedy, which is exactly what I need in my life. This last month, I've been watching a lot of horror movies and shows, and I want something a little bit silly that I've never watched before. So I'm gonna need some popcorn, do that, and I'll see you again, I guess, with my final book of the video. I'm gonna go get a popcorn, and then we can like dump M&Ms into it. That way every handful is like, that's suspenseful. Oh. Hello, final book of the video, The Reformatory, and the final chance to get a five star and have a new favorite author. I've been reading this for a couple days now. I'm pretty deeply through it. Um, but I also am pausing here because 
the release date is tomorrow and that means the audiobook comes out tomorrow and it's narrated according to Libro FM by um, one of my favorite audiobook narrators Jonice Abbott Pratt and so I do also want to listen to this. It's going really well so far. We've gotten a lot of setup and naturally it's a slow horror. If you've read any other Tanana Reeve do it has the exact same kind of vibe and pace and I can't remember how much I told you about it in the intro if any. So um, we're following this young boy Liam's age um, named Robbie my husband's name and he basically got in trouble because this um, white character was kind of harassing his sister and he stood up for her end up kicking him and he got sent to this reformatory and they're acting like it's a good thing because he doesn't have to go to prison because he's not quite at that age yet um and different people are talking about it differently so they're acting like it's a school they're telling some people that it's a place for him to just be away and become a better person but he's also going to get like good schooling and good education and they're going to give him everything he needs and then there's people who are like no we know that the school the school the reformatory terrible things have happened there's this history of a bunch of kids who died in a fire and then of course since all of the kids who have done bad things or you know have been racially profiled um are being sent there they know that it is a place of punishment and robbie doesn't have a lot of people sticking up for him because his mother has died his father is away and also is hated by a lot of people. So um, some people are trying to use him as a way to get to like lure his father back to town. So that's what's going on with him. And then when that all goes down, the only person who's really there to help him out is his sister. So we're also hearing Gloria's perspective. And at first, it's just like, she wants to go to the school. She thinks if she shows up there, she can advocate for him or she can find somebody to advocate for him. And it evolves into her meeting other people and kind of making dealings and really she's willing to do anything to get her brother home. He has a pretty short sentence though um, like he's supposed to return to the family within six months but she's learning about like the dark and underbelly of all of this and how uh, typically the kids even when they're supposed to get out in a certain time they find a way they convince somebody um the judge to extend their sentence or they end up dying in the reformatory so naturally everybody's really worried about robbie and while robbie is there he's connecting with these things called haints um which are ghosts and at first he doesn't know what they are and he just thinks that they're other students or other kids who are there and then learns all about and gets welcomed in by a couple of the other kids there and learns the ropes and gets like a job the things that he has to do in order to live there and survive and you know they're using chores as punishment slave labor essentially and that's what we're up to so he's trying to survive she's trying to help him um I imagine there's going to be like a lot of action at some point but I've really liked everything so far. I do imagine there's this like big climactic uh, revenge sequence. The ghosts perhaps are going to become more a part of the story. But yeah I'm gonna finish this up tomorrow so I'll see you then. Hello good morning happy Halloween. I could not be more excited about my costume. It's not really a costume but like obviously the Halloween parties and stuff we're on the weekend. This is just the Halloween fit. Rob and I, I got him one too. We are just going to be hanging out at a bonfire, drinking hot chocolate, watching fireworks while Liam trick or treats with um, some of his friends. So this year I actually got Liam an inflatable costume which he's been asking for for forever. But the thing about those is he can't wear them to school and also, we just trick or treat around our neighborhood. Like, we often have friends with us. Sometimes we'll go to a friend's house and it just doesn't feel like he's actually gonna wear the hundred and whatever $50 costume for very long. So it doesn't really feel worth it. But this year is the first year he's, we're dropping him off. He's going out on his own. So I bought this super overly expensive dinosaur inflatable costume and I hope he just has the best time. This is definitely like the worst Day of the week to have Halloween right like Tuesdays. Tuesdays are I think definitively somebody back me up in the comments the worst day of the week. People will say Monday 
but I actually think that Mondays go by really fast because the weekend's over and you're getting back into work stuff, um, or at least I am, I have in my life. And Tuesday is just like, oh my God, you wake up on Tuesday and you just feel like the weekend is so far away. Anyway, I'm a giant jack-o'-lantern. Um, I feel like when I was a teen, we didn't have Halloween parties on like the weekend. Like no matter when Halloween was, we were partying that night. Like we were trick-or-treating and then we were partying, even if it was a Tuesday. But maybe that's actually, let me do some quick math. Maybe just the Halloweens that I remember the most actually fell on the weekends. Oh my God, yeah. Okay, so when I was 18, it was on a Friday. When I was 19, it was on a Saturday. So peak Halloween partying years, like when you're just legal to drink, those bush parties, it makes sense that I'm remembering them as being on Halloween because Halloween was actually on the weekend. And it's gonna be the same for Liam because if Tuesday is Halloween this year, when he's in like 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, it'll be Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I guess it's okay that it's on Tuesday this year. I do approve because in his best party years, <laughs> it'll be on the weekends too. Um, I'm currently reading this. I did pick up the audiobook. It is fantastic as expected. I haven't moved my bookmark, so I don't know how much further in I've gotten. Not very, because I have a lot going on today. I have a lot going on today. Can't you tell? I'm lounging in my pumpkin. I'll probably check in with you at the end of the night. Maybe I'll be finished the book. Maybe I'll just be a couple chapters in. I don't know, but I'm excited to go down to the fireworks with my husband because we never do that. We can see it from our neighborhood, but we're actually gonna be down there and in it. And this is baggy enough that I can fit like a good hoodie and thick leggings underneath because I do believe it's supposed to be super duper cold. Negative one. That's not crazy. Crazy enough to wear thermals though. Okay, that's it. See ya. Oh, in the camera, my hat doesn't even look green. How? That's lime green. I know, it looks yellow. It looks like I don't even understand what a pumpkin looks like. That's wild. That's like a completely different color. Show them your costume. <clears throat> I'm go. a pumpkin. We're gonna film a Halloween candy bracket later tonight for my channel members so candy playoffs baby hit the link down below for a good time let's go oh my god why are you yelling at me fire sounds by the fire it's so big completed my final book and it's pretty best case scenario. It was five stars. We ended the video with the success and the series with the success we wanted all along. I do have a new favorite author that I can add to the list because this was five stars. From what I've read from Tana Reeve Do, this is her best. I would definitely recommend taking a couple days, weeks to read it. It is bleak, it is sad, and you're confronting a lot of awful truths. It's got that exact perfect balance of real life horrors. There are just sick, sadistic punishments and just violence enacted by people who are unfairly placed in power positions. And then you have the supernatural entities, which don't necessarily bring a lot of horror throughout the book, but obviously what happened to them is horrific. I liked both the perspectives we were reading from. They were both dealing with really challenging things and they both used all of their resources and had to find strength and resilience to get through their circumstances when that's not something anybody should ever have to do. It was equally as sad as it was powerful, as it was ominous. Um, and I think that's exactly the type of story that Tana Reeve Do wants to write. It was a success. And a final quick tally of the series as a whole. If you've been following the series, you know that every season or every year has had a different goal. So in season one, it was reading authors that I have read two books from that I didn't like. And the third time's the charm was to see, should I ever read them again? Or should I never continue. In episode one, I decided I will read more from Brandy Colbert, but I don't know about the other two. In episode two, I don't really feel confident about any of these authors. Thriller books that I read, I'd be open to a couple of them, Alice Feeney, B.A. Paris, but maybe I've already read their best. In episode three though, I ended up with two big wins as I read Sylvia Moreno Garcia and Sarah Gailey for the third time and had great success. Season two, the goal was to figure out which was the fluke from these authors. They were ones that I had read, one book I loved, 
from and one book I hated from. And the third time's the charm. Had me checking out a bunch of thriller authors again. And I think I'll read from Kimberly McCrate, but I don't know about the other two. Then we had a bunch of sci-fi authors. And again, I think I've already read my favorites from a couple of them, but today Thompson, I will continue to read. I'm not cutting anyone completely off from this specific season. The final episode was a great success because I had a four or five star read from Bethany C. Morrow, Madeline Miller, and Jasmine Ward, which had me going into season three with a lot of confidence because I just needed to find a five star and I could consider the author that I'd read two five stars from before an all time favorite. The first episode is actually the one in the middle and none of those, even though I'm going to desaturate them, know that I'm not saying I'm not reading them ever again. It's just that all of their books were a three or four in this video. So they didn't officially get added to my all time favorites list. The top episode was one a little bit messy because some of them were short stories. Some of them I realized different things in the video. However, I think I could consider Carmen Mia Machado, Roxane Gay, and River Solomon favorite authors of mine. And then as you just saw in this final episode, we had Ruth Ware and Mona Awad, who I will read more from for sure in the future. But Tanarif Du is the only one who is going onto my all-time favorites list. That's it for me though. I will see you next time. Thank you so much for watching.